everyone, thanks for joining us once again. So excited because we have Dr. Damon Kennedy, who is now the official president at Midland College. Congratulations on the new gig, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much. Did that catch you by surprise when you found out? Um, yeah, a little bit. I'm, yeah? I, you know, there's always an element of surprise mm -hmm. when, you, when you get into a process like this. You, you, know, you have high hopes for, for the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are always variables and a lot of things beyond your control. So yeah, a little bit of surprise, but uh, very pleased. Yeah, and we all are. And so this is your first official week, right? It is, my first day was Monday. Yeah, yeah. So talk a little bit about your backstory. So you're a West Texas native. Uh, where did this all start? Because you have a line of educators in your sure. family too, right? Yeah, sure. So I, I grew up in Snyder. I was born and raised in Snyder. And um, I played tennis my whole life. And one of the things that uh, that enabled me to do was to travel a fair amount. My, my parents made a pretty broad commitment to the, our development as tennis players and uh, myself and my little brother were pretty good. We traveled uh, to Midland frequently to play tournaments and so I actually began playing tennis tournaments at Midland College uh, before I turned 10 years old. Um, it was like your life foreshadowing the future. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it seemed like, you know, looking back, it yeah. seems like probably that is the case. Um, I graduated high school after only three years just because things were, you know, high school wasn't my thing. Uh, I was pretty green, not really prepared to go to a university, and so I, I ended up at Midland College as a student in 1992. Um, and, and that set me on a path, you know, you're talking about foreshadowing, that really set me uh, on a path to doing this work today. Uh, you mentioned the fact that my, I come from a family of educators, that's true. My, my, my father was a, a, a lifelong public school administrator. Um, my mother was a counselor diagnostician. I have a brother who's a teacher. And so, yeah, we have a, we have a lot of my daughter is a pre-K teacher. And so we have a lot of that in, in our family. But I was exposed at Midland College to a number of really great human beings. I mean, they were great educators, but more so they were great human beings that uh, set me on a path toward success in higher education. So I went from Midland College uh, to UTPB and then from UTPB to Texas Tech. And I uh, came back to Midland in 2003, had a brief stint at the Petroleum Museum, and then I began teaching as an adjunct uh, history instructor at Midland College in 2004. From there, went into a full-time history uh, professor position, dean of social behavioral sciences and business, and then I have been the vice president of instructional services for the last five years. And I've uh, been the president of Midland College for two days, so or three days <laughs> now. I feel like your <laughs> resume is it's just, here's uh, Dr. Kennedy, the jack of all trades, basically. Yeah, and I, <laughs> and I, and I joke um, often with folks that being a community college administrator, you have to be a utility player mm -hmm. um, because we're a relatively, you know, by higher ed standards, a small organization. So you have to be willing to, to dig in in multiple areas. Uh, you have to be willing in periods of transition of, of leadership positions to take on additional responsibilities and then you know hopefully you get solid hires in behind and you can then relinquish some of that but yeah you have to do a little bit of everything and so when so before i wanted to talk a little bit about how you led the launch of the pre-k academy at midland college which which is a huge deal how did what was the story behind that i guess how did that all start well it, it, the origins are well over a decade old um, and and they start with conversations with Midland College about offering quality developmental seats for young children so that families can go to work you know we we successfully operate our Great House and Manor Park Children's Centers um, they are they are known through the, our community for being high quality and so for years and years there have been conversations about how we might be able to expand those um, the challenge with um, child care is the expense and finding a balance between what it costs to provide services and what families can afford and, and that kind of thing. And so when we first began talking about additional seats, uh, one of the things that was front and center for me was how we build a sustainable, sustainable financial model. Um, because we're a taxing entity, we're, we want to remain stewards of, uh, 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 good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And so we ban began exploring ways to make it sustainable, scalable. And in 2017, 
the Texas legislature uh, adopted um, uh, Senate Bill 1887, which authorized in-district charter schools. And Midland College actually became the first uh, uh, institute, institution of higher education to partner with a school district uh, to, to, to build out a charter. So in 2017, we began that process. And I'll share that um, the work was done by a phenomenal team of people led by folks in our own organization, Denise McCallan, who's now our Dean of Education, um, and then on the MISD side, uh, then uh, Chief Innovation Officer, um, who, who was Elise Kale. Dr. Kale did a lot of work on, on the ISD side. And so it, it, was, it was a year and a half worth of really, really hard work uh, to, to get to a point where we were able to launch in the fall 2018. And so, We've been at it uh, since that time. Uh, we currently serve 68 kids. Uh, half of those are three-year-olds, half of those are four-year-olds. And we're going to be scaling that project beginning in the fall. So we have a 30 plus million dollar building coming online in wow. August. Mm -hmm. And so we'll serve 296 kids wow. um, uh, as we go forward. That's insane. And so uh, we've been doing updates on the building. How's it looking right now? It's. It's surreal to me yeah. to think that uh, 10 years of, of labor um, is coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I walk through and I see the bright primary colors, you know, the reds and the greens and the yellows and the things that, uh, that, that indicate we're getting very near the conclusion, you know, they buttoned up the building and there's air conditioning and um, it's, it's, it's just, again, it's a surreal experience to walk through and see it. but. Um, we're in, we're in really good shape. A lot of credit goes to um, architects and to contractors and to our executive director of facilities. Joe Butts has done a great job in keeping this thing on task. And so um, it's exciting. It is so exciting. And so the thing for anyone who is just learning about this, the thing about this pre-K building, it's basically a one-stop shop for the educators too. They could go to class and they can go and teach, Correct. right? Correct. So the base level of the, of the facility is our pre-K academy. And then the second level is our division of education. And so that is gonna be home to our faculty and staff with, within that division that, that, that leads our, our efforts to train uh, early childhood teachers. And so it's a really cool opportunity for students to learn in an environment where they will work in the future. It's also uh, an opportunity for, for us to integrate some of what's happening on the lower level with what's happening on the upper level. Um, we, we utilize the Pre-K Academy as a lab school, and so our students are gonna have uh, hands-on, real-world opportunities from day one, and that's something that we think is really, really important when you train teachers. For sure, and one of the things that I also wanted to touch on is teacher shortages. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see it happen across the country, across the state of Texas. So how important do you think that this will be, this building, this, this program to kind of bridge that gap with the teacher shortage? I, I think it's important, the, the work that we're doing. I, I think the gap is sizable. Um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity moving forward to work in collaboration with our partners to the West, both UTPB and OC. Mm -hmm in developing programs that are, that are gonna meet the needs of this community. And I think that's really, really important work that both, oh, not both, but all three organizations are committed to doing. And so do you, does Midland College, how hard do you guys work at it with trying to retain teachers? And that's the thing is like, we wanna keep everyone local, right? Right. We, we begin uh, recruiting in high school and we begin working with students through dual credit um, we, we've, we've had some challenges over time um, in getting to where we need to be, uh, but I have to say that I feel supremely confident in the leadership within the district um, and the path that they're taking. They have some uh, um, internal initiatives too and work ongoing in, in human capital management. And so I think the, the partnership between the district and the college can, um, can yield some results. And would you say that for any uh, Teach, student teachers who are working to get into, you know, the kindergarten classroom. Is the transition seamless as far as going from the pre-K academy and then going into an actual classroom? Yeah, so our, our students uh, in our program will, will work not only in our, our pre-K academy, but also on campuses within the district. Um, and, and because we're working at certification level through third grade, 
they're getting a chance to be on elementary campuses as well and and to and to work with seasoned experienced teachers um, within MISD um, I wouldn't say that the transition is ever seamless okay. because when you go from being a student teacher and you know you develop some of your your own lesson plans and those kinds of things you have a supervisory teacher there with you in the room it's a clinical experience and mm -hmm. then um, you get opportunities to work in small groups and centers and in some days if uh, you know if your teacher's gone you get a whole classroom but it's but it's a little different when you go first day right. and it's yours and you you have an assistant teacher with you you have some supports but you're in charge and, and it's yours yeah and you guys have a lot of healthcare programs at the college too do. is a, do you guys have a different way in approaching that as far as keeping them here we we have a great partnership again with midland health um, i'll tell you we've had some challenges in staffing our faculty positions because um, faculty positions don't pay uh, the same salaries as practitioners. So if you're a nurse, for example, at the bedside, you're going to make significantly more money than you would in a classroom. And so we have done really phenomenal work with with partners at Midland Health and uh, give a lot of a lot of credit to people like Kit Britomus and Michael Hall um, in our nursing program, because absent their creativity, we probably struggle right now to admit students. And so we can't even begin to have conversations about whether or not we're retaining them, keeping them local because we have such a struggle staffing uh, some of our programs. Why do you think that is? I, I think honestly the, that through, through COVID, mm -hmm. um, the health professions have been kind of beat up. Um, I think people are exhausted. Um, I, I think you see some of the work that, that Tom Craddock has done in, in coordinating some funding for behavioral health initiatives here in Midland, and that, that includes dollars that, that are coming to Midland College as we build out a psychiatric technician program. Um, what you see is that is people are tired. Um, and so if, if folks are beginning to think about making a career change, they don't necessarily want to move from the bedside and into the classroom because classroom instruction isn't necessarily that much easier. It takes a lot of commitment in terms of time. Um, and again, if, you know, if you're fatigued, you may not want to do that, you may not want to make that. And then as I say, salaries, uh, while I think we're competitive, I, I, I don't think we can compete with the salaries of practitioners. What would you say to someone out there who's maybe interested and maybe they can get into some of these programs at Midland College, but maybe they're a little scared to do so? I, I think what I would say to students coming in is that we provide uh, tremendous supports we have an abundance of financial aid opportunities and so if, if if money is a challenge for you don't let that be the obstacle we have great faculty i mean I, I i'm coming out of a role where i've overseen all the faculty on our campus we have great faculty and i i look at i look at covid as a positive in some ways you know it's hard it's hard for you to maybe consider covid being a positive but we learned a lot about ourselves yeah, through covid mm -hmm. We, we learned a lot about how we can better serve students through COVID. And there was an element of humanity that, that I saw surface through COVID. And it was very impressive to me, particularly our health sciences faculty, our applied technology faculty, the level of their commitment. Now all of the faculty were committed to students, but, but the level of the, of the faculty that worked very directly in high contact our courses with, with their students, is, it was phenomenal to me. You know, in, in the early spring of um, 2020, when it be began to look like things were going to go south, we started, we started, we, we tried to be proactive as much as you could, given the unknowns. Um, but it was phenomenal to me to, to, to have conversations with faculty. They know all their students' names, obviously, but they know the names of the spouse, the names of the children, the names of the dogs, where there's challenges in, in various households. It, it was, it's amazing. So. I would tell students, don't be afraid, because we, 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 we have everything you need to be successful at Midland College. There's a strong sense of camaraderie, I Absolutely. think. And every time I've met with some of the staff there too, that's what I feel, yeah. and so that's great. And so moving forward, are there any plans or any projects that you have up your sleeve? Well, I mentioned the psychiatric technician. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've secured um, from the legislature $1.75 million for the next two years to build out uh, three behavioral health programs. And so we're going to be working in concert with, um, with Midland Health and others uh, to, to 
train uh, the employees of a new behavioral health facility that hopefully will come online in the next couple of years. We're working and have been working um, very closely with MISD and business and industry partners um, to design, to update old programs and design new programs and then build out a new CTE facility on the main campus that we hope can serve significantly greater number of dual credit students and our traditional students as well as continuing education did you want to have so did you want to have a new CTE building just to have that the proximity on campus there or what was the reason behind yeah that? there are a lot of efficiencies with 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 having the facility at the main campus instead of spread out in the way that we are now um, it's, it's, it's gonna be important to the school district and you hear the challenges that they face in finding bus drivers and trans, transporting uh, students from home to school, much less from school to school, mm -hmm. uh, that they do because of uh, uh, the formatting of the, of the grades. And so we think there are a lot of efficiencies, instructional efficiencies, but also budgetary efficiencies mm -hmm. by being on one campus. But uh, the real motivation is that the world of work around us is changing and evolving and we need to change and evolve with that. And we, we are, uh, we're handcuffed by the spaces that we have now. And so we're looking to build new, modern, flexible spaces that can change as the world of work changes. Absolutely. Was that something that maybe other people have reached out to you and like mentioned any concerns? Or if there's any <coughs> other concerns that people have brought up to you? No, I, I think and, and, and I hear all the time that CTE is this one of this community's most significant needs. I, I was about to say it is this community's most significant need. I, I could make that argument, but, but I don't want to be competitive in that way. <laughs> there are, we, we have a number of needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And kind of summing everything up, when we talk about early education, just education as a whole, why is that so important and why, why should that matter? Well, you know, education has an opportunity to change the trajectory of folks' lives. And um, we, we take our role very seriously in, in providing those opportunities to students. Uh, we have an exciting new project uh, uh, coming online that we're calling um, the College and Career Connection C3 for short, where we're going to be very intentional about reaching out to kids and families beginning in elementary school. To, to communicate opportunities both through programs of study in MISD, but also dual credit with Midland College and our programming. And we want to show pathways to universities and professional schools, and we want to give kids and families enough information that they can make sound decisions. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, families in this community who might not think they can afford college, but they can. And there are resources in Midland. Midland is a phenomenal place. Um, it is a generous community and there are financial resources in abundance and we want to make sure that families know that um, because as great as Midland is, it can be greater um, and education is a, is a, is a vehicle uh, to the, the evolution of our community. And throughout this interview, I know you have mentioned a lot of, you know, you mentioned the school district and why is it important for you to have Midland College be so heavily involved and just kind of be together as a, like unified as a community. Yeah, I, I've, I've used this phrase and, and, and people have come to uh, uh, utilize it as well, that Midland College can be the connective tissue. You see that the college and much of our programming overlaps with business and industry, whether it's the energy sector or healthcare sector. Um, it overlaps with the work that the, the city does, for example, uh, fire and police. Um, we're engaged in a little bit of everything and it doesn't make sense to me for the college to go at it alone. Um, we've been working on a framework for a new strategic plan. Uh, while I've only been on the job for two days, you know, my mind has been racing for a lot <laughs> longer than that. And one of the things that, that we're going to continue to be committed to, maybe more committed to now than ever, is prioritizing our partners' outcomes every bit as much as we, as we prioritize our own. So we talk about our perform key performance indicators internally. So we're helping ourselves, how can we help others? That's gonna be a real big 
um, a piece of the, of the work that, that I want to see happen at Midland College over the next uh, several years. Yeah, and it's great that you mentioned that because I do notice there are more families that are moving to the area, mm -hmm. so more families are having more kids, and it is important for Midland College to be part of that yeah. to, you know, for the future of Midland because yeah. we are a growing community. So yeah. glad you are here and glad you get to be a part of that. One last question I have for you. For anyone who is afraid of reaching that leadership role, and I mean, you've been at the college for yeah. what, 18, 19 years? Yeah. And so what kind of advice would you give to people who are maybe a little discouraged? Because it does sound a little scary sometimes. I, I tell people all the time that I'm the most impatient person you'll ever know. <laughs> I, I think leadership requires an element of impatience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, th I think that can be translated as urgency. You, know, you have to be careful about how you communicate those things. Um, I also think that there's a, there's a healthy amount of fear that goes along with leadership and it's probably a good thing. Um, if you're not a little bit afraid of the things that you're doing or the goals that you're trying to accomplish, then they're probably not big enough goals. Um, and so, you know, the simple, the simple advice is set the fear aside and go for it. If it's something you want to, if it's something you want to chase, chase it. There you go. Yeah. So there you go. Great advice that you can hear from Dr. <laughs> Kennedy himself. Thank you so much for being yeah, here. And I'm so excited to do more interviews with you because yeah. I'm sure that there will be a lot more after Absolutely. all these projects you get done. Lots of news to share. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to catch our other interviews and other stories on our app 9 plus, but we hope to see you next time. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.